is celebrating Easter this weekend. They celebrate Good Friday. They celebrate Easter Sunday. But they miss one of the most important parts of that story. Jesus rested between Friday and Sunday. Amen? Amen. He kept the Sabbath. Even, he even stopped his work of redemption in order to rest on the Sabbath. And that's what we're doing today. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning and talk about eternal things, we ask your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts. Don't let us be distracted by the devil. Help us to get something from this message today that we can use in our lives, both today and from now on, because we're asking it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's kind of interesting, the title of my sermon this morning, if you look at your bulletin, the title of my sermon is The End of the Trail, and I think there may have been some divine intervention going on here because two people looked at that title and got it, they changed it to the end of the trial. Well, I think maybe you ought to take your pen and write trail and trial both in there because they both apply. So I want to share a little history with you first. A fascinating episode in the history of America. How many of you like history? Eh, some of us, but you know what? Some of us are probably more involved with history and knowing about history than we know. Because I'm going to talk about a huge migration to the West. Thousands of people in the East left homes and families and friends and loved ones and started out with high hopes and wide-eyed dreams of a proverbial promised land, a place where land was free for the taking, lush, fertile land with abundant fresh water, a long growing season, enough to tempt anybody. Or if you were a little more adventurous, you could go to areas where the discovery of gold had excited the whole nation. From the mid-1840s to the early 1850s, the main route for settlers and gold seekers headed west was what we know as the Oregon Trail. How many of you heard of it? The Oregon Trail. It began at the far western frontier of civilization. Anybody know where that was? The far western frontier in the 1840s was St. Louis. That's as far as America went. So they began in St. Louis, Missouri. They followed the Missouri River west till they got to the smaller, shallower Platte River. Then they followed that north. And then um, that led them west all the way to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So they had a route. All they had to do was follow the river, right? And we've all read stories or seen TV shows or movies about those big covered wagons and long caravans headed west, haven't we? Piled to their tops with the belongings and hopes of families, all looking for a better place to settle. A family of four would need about a half a ton of food to sustain them on that trip. And by the way, that trip was about 2,000 miles. Everybody take a 2,000 mile trip in a wagon? The only way to transport that much was with a big, sturdy wagon. But it wasn't only food they needed. They also had to pack their wagon with tools, a water barrel, planting seeds, Furniture, clothing, if you're going to plant seeds, you need a plow, right? Had to pack that in there, and as many other cherished belongings as they could handle. Once they got a few miles down the trail, they realized they had seriously overpacked. 
Anybody been there? The only choice was to start throwing things out. Think of the tears and the heartache. Heartbreaking decisions. What can we save? Oh, no, we can't throw that away. What do we have to get rid of? The trail was so scattered with cast-off items that people would follow from the towns, scavenging wagon loads of flour, clothes, even cast iron stoves. It became a really lucrative job just to follow those wagons and pick up stuff that got thrown away. After a few days on the trail, everybody settled into a routine, get up before dawn, hitch up the oxen, fix breakfast, and hit the trail. About noon, there was an hour break for lunch, and then about 6 p.m., they would stop and set up camp. Fires were started, supper was prepared, Cooking over campfires is a challenge all by itself. Some of you have tried it. Any campers here? Something about cooking over an open fire, you end up with a lot of food that's burned on the outside and raw on the inside. Right? And then there's dirt and bugs you have to deal with. By about 9 p.m., they would bed down for the night, going to sleep with sheer exhaustion. And that just before the sun came up the next morning, they would start all over again. 15 miles a day on a good day for six to eight months. Try to imagine yourself doing this. Because the wagons were so full, few people could ride. Some of them traveled all 2,000 miles on foot. And then there were the rivers. Hundreds drowned trying to cross the Kansas, the North Platte, the Columbia, and other rivers. The huge wagons didn't have any safety features. If somebody fell under the huge iron-tired wheels, death was instant. Many lost their lives that way, most of them little children. What a pleasure trip. Horrible prairie storms took their toll. Some were killed by lightning. Others were killed or seriously injured by hail the size of apples. Probably the most serious problem was a mysterious and deadly disease called cholera. There was no known cure. Often, very often, a traveler would go from perfectly healthy to dead in just a couple of hours. Sometimes they received a proper burial. Often, the sick would be abandoned in their beds on the side of the trail. They would die alone. Cholera killed more travelers than anything else. In a bad year, some wagon trains lost 75% of their people to cholera. And we haven't even mentioned crossing the rugged mountains, the deserts, hostile natives, snakes, scorpions. We could probably make a longer list. So my question for you today is, why did they do it? What possessed them? Why did they risk everything? One historian wrote, the cowards never left home, and the weak died along the way. Why did they do it? All because of a hope, a dream of a better future in a better place. And the ones who did complete the trip, their dreams came true. They arrived in the lush, fertile land of Oregon in Northern California, land that even today feeds a large part of America. 
and ships their abundant produce to countries around the world. We also are on a long journey to a better future in a better place. Amen? I want to read you something. Sister White wrote a little narrative in the book Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2. The title of this little section is An Impressive Dream. Listen. While at Battle Creek in August 1868, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons. As we journeyed, the road seemed to climb. On one side of this road was a steep, deep precipice. On the other was a high, smooth white wall like the hard finish on a plastered room. So you get the picture? We've got a trail here. You go too close here, you hit the wall. You go too far this way, and off you go. All right? As we journeyed on, the road grew narrower and steeper. In some places, it seemed so very narrow that we concluded we could no longer travel with these loaded wagons. We loosed them from the horses, took a portion of the luggage from the wagons, and placed it upon the horses and journeyed on horseback. As we progressed, the path still continued to grow narrow. We were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves from falling off the narrow road down the steep precipice. As we did this, the luggage on the horses pressed against the wall and caused us to sway toward the precipice. We feared that we would fall and be dashed to pieces on the rocks. So we cut the luggage from the horses and it fell over the precipice. We continued on horseback, greatly fearing as we came to the narrower places in the road that we should lose our balance and fall. At such times, a hand seemed to take the bridle and guide us over the perilous way. As the path grew more narrow, we decided that we could no longer go with safety on horseback. We left the horses and went on foot, single file, one following in the footsteps of another. Now pay attention. You get the picture, right? This journey is getting harder and harder. At this point, small cords were let down from the top of the pure white wall. These we eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping our balance on the path. As we traveled, the cord moved along with us. The path finally became so narrow that we concluded that we could travel more safely without our shoes. We slipped them from our feet and went on some distance without them. Then it was decided that we could travel more safely without our stockings. These were removed and we journeyed on barefoot. We then thought about those who had not been accustomed to privations and hardships. Where were they now? They were not in the company. At every change, some were left behind. And only those remained who had accustomed themselves to endure hardship. The troubles of the way only made these more eager to press on to the end. Our danger of falling from the pathway increased. We pressed close to the white wall. Yet we could not place our feet fully on the path. It was too narrow. We then suspended nearly our whole weight on the cords, exclaiming, we have hold from above, we have hold from above. The same words were uttered by all the company in the narrow pathway. As we heard the sounds of mirth and partying that seemed to come from the abyss below, we shuddered. We heard profane oaths, vulgar jests, 
low, vile songs. We heard war songs and dance songs. We heard instrumental music and loud laughter mingled with cursing and cries of anguish and bitter wailing. And we're more anxious than ever to keep upon the narrow, difficult pathway. Much of the time, we were compelled to suspend our whole weight on the cords, which increased in size as we progressed. I noticed that the beautiful white wall was stained with blood. It caused a feeling of regret to see the wall thus stained. This feeling, however, lasted but for a moment as I soon thought that it was all as it should be. Those who are following after will know that, know that others have passed the narrow, difficult way before them and will conclude that if others were able to pursue their onward course, they can do the same. And as the blood shall be pressed from their aching feet, they will not faint with discouragement, but seeing the blood upon the wall, they will know that others have endured the same pain. At length, we came to a large chasm at which our path ended. There was nothing now to guide our feet, nothing upon which to rest them. Our whole reliance must be upon those cords, which had increased in size until they were as large as our bodies. Here we, for a, we were for a time thrown into perplexity and distress. In fearful whispers we asked, to what is the cord attached? My husband was just ahead of me. Large drops of sweat were falling from his forehead. The veins in his neck and temples were increased to double their usual size. Suppressed groans came from his lips. The sweat was dropping from my face, and I felt such anguish as I had never felt before. A fearful struggle was before us. Should we fail here, all the difficulties of our journey had been experienced for nothing. Ahead of us, on the other side of the chasm, was a beautiful field of green grass. I could not see the sun, but bright soft beams of light, resembling fine gold and silver, were resting on the field. Nothing I had seen upon earth could compare in beauty and glory with that field. But could we reach it? Should the cord break, we would perish. Again, in whispered anguish, the words, the words were breathed, Who holds the cord? For a moment we hesitated to venture. Then we exclaimed, Our only hope is to trust wholly to the cord. It has been our dependence all the way. It will not fail us now. Still, we were hesitating and distressed. Somebody said, God holds the cord. We will not fear. These words were then repeated by those behind us, accompanied with, He will not fail us now. He had brought us this far safely. My husband then swung himself over the abyss into the beautiful field beyond. Immediately, I followed. And oh, what a sense of relief and gratitude to God we felt. I heard voices raised in triumph and praise to God. I was happy, perfectly happy. And then she awoke from her dream. I want you to notice something. There's nothing in this story about an easy trip. Amen? In fact, it mentions bloody footprints. Some of us know what it is to suffer hardship. We've had trouble and heartaches. Some of our loved ones and family members just don't understand us. Amen? They don't agree with what we believe. Some of us may have lost jobs because of our convictions. And if we haven't had hard times yet, just wait. We will. My question today is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I want to read you some things that I 
found in a little book called End Time Events. In vision, Ellen White was privileged to see glimpses of the coming reward. I want to share some of them with you. Prophets and Kings. In the earth made new, the redeemed will engage in the occupations and pleasures that brought happiness to Adam and Eve in the beginning. We will live the Eden life. Sounds pretty good, huh, Tom? Great controversy. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. She saw these things in vision. She tried to explain what she was seeing. She didn't have the words for it. In fact, doesn't the scripture say, eye has not seen, nor ear heard? Another quote from Great Controversy, there are ever flowing streams, clear as crystal. Beside them, waving trees cast their shadows upon paths prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There, the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits on those peaceful plains. Beside those living streams, God's people will find a home. We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning. How many of you are sick and tired of getting sick and tired? We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning. Now listen to this. The acquirement of knowledge. How many of you like to learn new things? Sure. But you can only do that for so long and your brain gets tired, right? She says the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind. I plan on learning for eternity. How about you? Book Education says there will be music there. Such music and song as neither ear has heard or mind conceived. You know, we think of some of the great classical music of the ages and, and what, what majestic chords and anthems we hear. We haven't heard a thing yet. How about travel? You like to travel? You like to explore? How about this one? All the treasures of the universe. How many? All the treasures of Hammond, Chicago, United States. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's people. I like that. I plan on doing a lot of studying, a lot of learning. See, it's going to be easy to learn when our minds don't keep forgetting things, right? Listen to this. Every power, how many? Every power will be developed. She's talking about the redeemed, right? Every power will be developed. Every capability, what's a capability? Anything you can do, right? Every capability will be increased. The grandest enterprise. Have you ever thought about building your own house? Joanne and I get a kick out of watching these YouTube videos on television. <clears throat> People that go out in the middle of nowhere and build a little log cabin. Or some guy digs into the side of a rock cave and builds a house in there. And I think, man, oh man, they got a lot of energy and a lot of ambition, right? <clears throat> The grandest enterprises will be carried forward. You want to build your own house? Go for it. You got plenty of time. You got plenty of strength. You got plenty of resources. Build your own house. Build it out of diamonds if you want to. The loftiest aspirations will be reached. How high can you dream? That's not high enough. You can reach higher. The highest ambitions will be realized. And still, there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of body and mind and soul. 
Some people say, man, I don't think I'm interested in heaven. I don't want to sit on a cloud and play a harp all the time. <laughs> Boy, are they missing it, huh? Listen to this. It's not enough that we can travel the universe, explore the wonders of the cosmos. The people of God, listen to this, will be privileged to have open communion with the Father and the Son. You know, we've been studying in Sabbath school about what, a, what an incredible gift Adam and Eve were given. They could commune with their maker. Of course, sin got in the way. But sin's going to be taken care of one of these days. We will be privileged to have open communion with the Father and the Son. We shall see face to face without a dimming veil between. And then she says, in Desire of Ages, there will be a close, tender relationship between God and the risen saints. How would you like to have a close, personal, tender relationship with the creator of the universe? It'll happen. We're getting close to the end of our journey. Do you want to be an overcomer? I want to look at these verses again in our scripture text. Turn in me with your turn with me into your in your Bibles to Revelation again. And I want to see if you can find a common theme in these three verses. Revelation 2 7. I'm going to skip the first part because God's just kind of emphasizing. He said, if you got ears, listen. Right? Then he says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We don't know what that tree of life looked like. We don't know what the fruit looked like. We sure don't know what it tasted like. But if you're an overcomer, you'll find out. What about Revelation 3, verse 5? He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Can you imagine going in through the gates into the city, and Jesus meets you there, and he puts his arm around you, and he says, Father, I got somebody I want you to meet. My personal friend. That's what it means when it says he's going to confess us before the Father, right? Wow. One more verse. Revelation 5, or I'm sorry, 321. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Not only will we be introduced to the Father by Jesus himself, not only will we have a chance to taste the, tree, the fruit from the tree of life, we even get our own throne. I don't know about you, that sounds pretty good to me. What's the common denominator? We have to be overcomers. Amen? Do you want to be an overcomer? What a shameful waste it would be to give up now. There's a, there's a uh, Southern Gospel song that says, I've gone too far to turn back. That should be our motto. And don't forget those chords in the story. The support we can depend on, the strength we have to have in order to finish our trip is not our strength. It's the strength from above that heaven is waiting and eager to provide every one of us. Is, there, is the path going to get narrow? Oh yeah. Is it going to get steep? Absolutely. Is it going to cause some apprehension, some worry, some pain? Very likely. Do you want to be an overcomer? Do you want to finish your trip? We're almost at the border of the promised land. Do you believe it? If you don't believe it, watch the news for a couple of nights. I don't know how, how much worse things are going to get. 
we are almost at the border of the promised land. If you'd like to commit yourself to completing the journey, to stay connected to those cords, the strength of Jesus, would you stand with me? And I'd like to pray for all of us. Loving Father in heaven, we're weak, but we want to finish what we've started. Hold on to us, we pray. Keep us attached to you. Make us willing to lay aside anything that would get between you and us. Any attitude, even any relationship, a habit, some cherished possession that's become an idol in our lives. Give us your power, we pray. Take us the rest of the way, day by day, until you welcome us into your kingdom. We ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Oh, okay. Number 626. In a little while, we are going home. Amen. Thank you, Brother John, for this message of hope. And if we do not faint and get discouraged, we will be home shortly. 626. 626. First, second, and fourth stanzas. All right, everyone sing it. Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we're going home. For the night will end in the everlasting day in a little while we're going home in a little while in a little while we shall go we shall meet at loss in the gloomy winds of past in a little while we're going Second stanza. We will do the work that our hands may find to do in a little while we're going home. And the grace of God will our daily strength renew in a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while. We shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. Four stanza. There's a rest beyond, there's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in the city bright and fair In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows roar We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past in a little while we're going home. John. Loving Father, we just thank you for the promise that if we're willing to hang in there, finish our journey, that we'll be able to eat from the tree of life. That we'll be introduced to the Father by Jesus himself. That we'll have thrones to reign from. Don't let us give up now, we pray.
hold on to us and save us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Kindly be seated. Thanks for coming. You'll be ushered out.